Hi, uh, my name is uh, Vahan Davudian. I'm a physics experimentalist for 30 years. And today our topic is spectroscopy or spectroscope, which is very important, versatile, and indispensable tool for discovering planets, stars, and so many discoveries in our you know, astronomy and physics. Yes, I have like 30 years experience in experimentation or experimenting laws of physics. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank YouTube for this wonderful opportunity for us so we can upload our videos, some other people can upload their videos, and you know, we learn from one another and we exchange views, and there is like a huge network, and in fact, I call the YouTube synapse, which in, in human brain is like a junction and connecting billions and billions of neurons for the communication and everything else. And uh, at the same time, I'd like to thank so many viewers, especially physics lovers. They emailed me, they appreciated what I'm doing, and they want more videos. And you know, anytime I'm at your disposal, anytime you need, you can email me. I'd be happy to help you. And thanks a lot for everything. And in fact, I have always replicated so many experiments from the you know, good physicists or good scientists as much as I could. Sometimes, you know, I didn't have the material or it was like a space and, you know, astronomy, so I couldn't do anything. But overall, you know, it, it, it doesn't mean that, you know, I didn't trust them, but, you know, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, that experiment works. So, and uh, today, this uh, spectroscopy is amazing. It has a long history, so I have to give you some history because it's important. In order to you guys to understand the concepts of physics or science, you have to know the history, who did what and how it started with. And before I started this spectroscopy, which is very important concept in physics, uh, I have to show you something and then I can exp explain. And in fact, uh, it all started with uh, light, because uh, this is one of the phenomena. It's been around like thousands of thousands of years, and people were fascinated with rainbow and you know, eclipse and some other things. And overall, everything has to do with the light. And I have to give you the history to tell you guys that what happened for the light, and then after that, you know who. Health. And then finally, in the 18th century, we came up with this spectroscope, which is so versatile, so good, and it discovered so many things. I mean, how could you do from here to the sun, or even the you know stars beyond sun, with like light years away from you? We can tell the composition, we can tell the density, we can tell how hot they are, and so on. So. Before I start, uh, you know, start a uh, spectroscopy, I have to give you some idea that uh, how it started, and then I can explain this. Everything is started with the light, and then uh, let me post this up. You can see. Of course, my next uh, one is going to be electromagnetism and uh, electromagnetic wave. And everything started, let me show you, with electromagnetic wave. As you know, the light, see this a small portion of the light is like from 600 nanometer all the way to 450, which is, you know, has more energy. This is the visible light, and that's what happened. With this light, we can analyze everything. And you can see this is called electromagnetic spectrum, and you can see over here much better. See this light? This visible light, see how a small portion. So we got like shorter wave and then we got ultraviolet, we got infrared and then longer one, which is, you know, start from here, radio wave, you see how long they are, and some of them are few meters. And then that goes here and then to visible light, UV, X-ray, and from finally to gamma rays. And then you can see the proportionality, how amazing these electromagnetic waves are. You know, the stretching, is exactly proportional to, you know, squishing or, you know, to compacting or 
condensing this. Everything is proportional. So this is the light, I mean, the visible light, and then you can see this is the you know, spectrum, and then I give you the history, what happened exactly. And then we can start our project with the spectroscopy, but I have to give, you know, refresh your memory that what happened for the light, or who started, in fact, uh, when we're talking about Sir Isaac Newton, and unfortunately, uh, he, he is one of the greatest, considered one of the greatest minds in the history of science, him and Maxwell and Albert Einstein. But unfortunately, everything is overshadowed by the laws of motion. And nobody talks about uh, Sir Isaac Newton optics. We is extremely important, you know, book. It's exactly like laws of motion and the other things. But unfortunately, uh, most people talk about laws of motion and, you know, acceleration, deceleration and things like that. When I studied that book, I realized he was amazing. I mean, at that time, he did fantastic job. Well, of course, I don't blame him. He was not as advanced as the others, you know, like 300 or 200 years after him. Because what Sir Isaac Newton did, he just uh, used prism a lot. And then let me show you. This is one of them. And this happened to be one of the most famous experiment in history. Let me post this. You can see it. See, light has so many things to offer, but unfortunately we have no idea what the light is and what are these lines over here, what does it mean by refraction, and what amazing device this, you know, I mean this devices, and then you see what happened, we have light here, it comes in a prism like this, and then it is just here we have the rainbow. At the same time, Sir Isaac Newton was an extremely smart person. So he did another one, inverted one. So what happened, he just culminated everything and then he had light over here again. And this happened to be so famous, this experiment, that you know, people realize it's like the equation. One side is equal to the other side. It doesn't matter how. But uh, before uh, Sir Isaac Newton, his name was Al Hazan, and uh, he was from Iraq. He was uh, considered the father of science of optic. He was 650 years before Newton, and he was an educated person, and he studied light, and even he had the human eyes. Well, of course, it's not as good as we have now, but uh, we're talking about 1,000 years ago. And then he started light, and then he described the rainbow, which I will do it later. And uh, this is what happened, and then Sir Isaac Newton came after him. Okay. We have to go back now to uh, spectroscopy, which is amazing, uh, I mean, device. Well, of course, it wasn't as good. You can see this is the black diagram. This is like a, you know, it doesn't show all the details, but it shows exactly what happened. This source doesn't have to be sun. There can be even light bulb. It can be any light. So what happened, this light is reflected to mirrors. And these mirrors are curved a little bit. Unfortunately, I couldn't show it over here. And then it is reflected again to grating. In fact, this grating is so amazing. You can watch this in any rainbows. You can see, you can see all kind of uh, rainbow colors here. So what happened, this grating shows that, you know, this is the way the lights are. And then here we detect this. Well, of course, I have to talk about this a lot. This detector shows a spectral line. This means exactly like a fingerprint. We have like seven billion or even more seven and a half billion people in the whole world, and their fingerprint is different. This spectral line are exactly like a fingerprint. So each element absorb and emit different wavelength, and each one has its own characteristic of spectral lines. And then they realize 
when they analyze this, uh, you know, great thing, and then they realize that this is a lot of science behind it. You can see we have like carbon, we have like hydrogen, we have like oxygen, all these elements, 105 or 110 elements. See, we have like this dark lines and we have this, uh, you know, bright lines. I will explain what do they mean by that. shows a little bit more detail about the spectral lines. Let me post this up, you can see. See, of course, I had to enlarge this a little bit so you can see it. This is called spectral lines. When I have to give you the history, what do we mean by these black lines over here? You know, these solid lines over here. But what do we mean by these emission lines over here, say like this? And in fact, there was a great genius in Germany. He was a lens maker. And of course, we owe it to him. He did not discover everything, but he just started and he initiated everything. And we owe it to him what he did for the science. And then after that, many years, and then Gustav Kirchhoff, you know, German physicist, and then uh, Robert Bunsen, which was a chemist also, German chemists, they came, they were so good, and then finally they solved the problem. And Sir Isaac Newton did only the spectrum, and then he had no idea what these lines are, because at that time Sir Isaac Newton had no idea whatsoever. So his name was Joseph Franz Hofer. He was a fantastic lens maker in Germany. At the same time, he was physicist. And then he had 571 lines like this from the sun. And it's amazing. And he had no idea what these lines are. And then it just happened to be... Gustav Kirchhoff and then Mr. Bonson, Robert Bonson, were at the same time in Germany. And they had to analyze this. But, you know, there was a big difference because uh, one of them was physicist, Gustav Kirchhoff, we used to teach in universities, he was a fantastic professor, even, you know, Max Planck was his the student, you know, the way they describe how good Gustav Kirchhoff was, and then the another one was uh, Robert Bunsen, and this guy was genius. Because anytime you have a flame, like, you know, blue flame, you cannot check or you cannot burn different elements because that light is interfering with the light is emitting with that heated element. But Bunsen did something amazing, which, I mean, is beyond my expectation, is beyond my imagination. He invented Bunsen burner. So what it was, it was not interfering with the light. So Mr. Fraunhofer did this great thing and then he just did, uh, in fact, he invented the spectroscope, I'll just show you in a minute. But poor man had no idea why we have these spectral lines, why we have absorption, you know, which is these black lines, and why we have emission, which is those, you know, bright lines. He had no idea whatsoever. But Mr. Robert Bonson came over and solved this problem. Before I explain about the Robert Bonson, that how genius he was, and then how he solved the problem, I have to post this, and then you can see how I started this. And it doesn't matter if you invent something like Mr. Fran Hofer, and you know everything about your device. It doesn't mean anything. So his name was uh, Joseph Fraunhofer. Like I said, he was a, a lens maker in Germany. It was in 1819. And then, of, of, of course, it was completed by Robert Bonson and Gustav Kirchhoff. And they, 
This is so important. Please listen carefully. They discovered each chemical element absorbs and emits its own characteristic combination of wavelengths, producing spectral lines. This is the way the helium was initially found in the sun. The spectroscope is used to study the composition of light emitted by the source. The range or spectrum of wavelength emitted by a source depends upon its constituent element and can be used to determine its composition. Imagine all these stars we have. You know, I'm, I'm not talking about our stars, which is so close. It's one. We're talking about stars like 10, 20, or thousands, or billions of light years away, they can get the light, they can analyze it, and they can realize what the composition is. But without the spectroscope, it could have been impossible to do that. So, the spectroscopy, so, I have to explain this later. They have to get the sample, which is gas. Otherwise, they won't be able to get the grating, they won't be able to, you know, uh, use the prism, you know, to get the lights and then to analyze it. So, this is what happened and then, in fact, uh, one amazing thing I just read a few minutes ago, helium did not, was not discovered on the surface of the Earth, was discovered in Sun. I mean, how amazing it is, that there is no way you won't be able to travel to Sun, or even, not even, you know, close to Sun, because they're far away. But we can get the light, we can analyze the light, and then we can get the spectral light, and take care of everything. And like I said, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Fraunhofer, discovered 574 lines, dark lines in sun. But uh, Robert Bunsen, I have to explain a little bit for him. Like I said, uh, Sir Isaac Newton used to use a uh, prism and then, uh, well, I read that book, which is a fantastic book, but I would say 90% are like, you know, prism and things like that, and the one I show you a few minutes ago, it was not about the spectroscopy, because Sir Isaac Newton had no idea about the spectroscopy, but Robert Bunsen was so good because he was the only one in the history of science that, you know, he heated different material. And then when I'm talking about heated, when I see like a sodium lights, well, of course, they're not around. This was like 25 years ago. They don't use that anymore. I have seen in, you know, autobahns. I have seen in the highways, you know, so sodium is like yellow. And then they have some other ones. They are consuming a lot of energy. Well, of course, at that time, I mean, the LED was not that good. Now they, they use LED, which is consuming less energy, is more efficient. But at those days, you know, they were using uh, sodium and some other you know, gas discharge, which was amazing. But unfortunately, the shortcoming was when you turn them off and then you have to wait for a long time to, you know, cool and then start all over again. But the LED is not like that. So this is the way Mr. Bunsen did. And then Gustav Kirchhoff was another physicist and they helped together and they find out that, you know, each element is unique. But I will explain why they're unique. I have to print this uh, so conceptually you can visualize exactly what I mean by a spectral line, what I mean by dark, dark lines and bright lines. What do we mean by that? Let me check this. These posters are so big, sometimes I'm having a hard time. Oh, gee, this is upside down, I'm sorry. See, this is a simple diagram, you can tell, very simple. So we have like hot gases over here, and you can see here, we get the 
emission lines. Well, of course, it also show what this is. This is just a sample, but it can be hydrogen, it can be oxygen, it can be anything. And this is the continuous spectrum. So in other words, it doesn't matter if you do this anytime, you know, in the sunshine or anything, you get this the lines, you know, red and then the orange all the way to blue. But if you get cold gases, see what happened, you get the lines. These are spectral lines because this is absorption. But this one is different. You get emission lines. This is another one, see, like hot gases shows bright lines, which is emission lines. And this is, you know, a spectrum for the dark lines or, you know, well, of course, there is a theory behind it. It's one of the greatest minds in the history of science. His name was Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr was amazing. He had Nobel Prize, and then he was a genius person anyway. So he discovered that uh, atomic uh, you know, structure, we have like shells. So we have like, it, you know, it depends on like, uh, so uh, like uh, hydrogen has less and then helium goes all the way to you know, uranium and so and so, they have like shells or orbitals. So each shell is different. When the electrons are jumping from the lower shell, uh, I mean shells, to the higher shell, so what happened, they are absorbing and then we get this bright, uh, we get this dark lines. Well, when they, go back to the ground state or when they go back they lose their energy they're emitting photon this is exactly what happened so when they emit photon like you know uh, hydrogen is different oxygen is different so each one is emitting its own characteristic lights for the emission that's the way we discovered that you know this is because this spectroscopy shows that you know if you get the grating and then you analyze everything, you realize how they are and then you can take care of everything. Well, of course, I didn't uh, tell you this. A spectroscopy, you know, atomic emission, spectra are produced when excited electrons return to the ground state. The emitted light of electrons correspond to energies of the specific electrons. An electron jumps from a lower energy level to a higher energy level by absorbing energy. It means we get the dark lines from higher energy level to lower energy by emitting photons. This is the basic for Niels Bohr theory and uh, he was amazing scientist and then I remember he proved this and then he got the Nobel Prize in 1900 for this. Okay, this is another one. Let me put this off for you. You can see. This is so important. Well, well, of course, all of you know Marie Curie. He was one of the greatest minds in the history of science. He was the only woman. He got the Nobel Prize two times. And then uh, he was the only woman to become university professor. And it was amazing. Her accomplishment is just unbelievable. It's beyond my imagination. Let me turn this light a little bit this way. I'm getting some shadow. It's the same thing. Okay, it's much better I think now. Okay. So all you know, Marie Curie, and then uh, when she had the polonium, and then she had the radium, she had no idea how to prove or how to substantiate her ideas. This light is bothering me. Let me just put it down, please. Yeah. Casting shadow on my face is much better, I think. So they had to call Mr. Eugene Demarque, I think. He was a specialist in the field of emission, and then he had a spectroscope, so they came over, they checked for Marie Curie, and then they realized that was polonium and the other one was radium. 
The same thing happened with another genius. Her name was Cecilia Payne. And she was the only woman in 1925. She was from England, astronomer. And you know, at those days, you know, there was no university for women that was so cruel at that time, but you know, somehow she made it all the way. But that was one of the great accomplishments in the history of mankind, I mean, in science. She discovered that, you know, what people believe about the stars is different. They were thinking the stars are like the Earth and so on. So she proved it by spectroscopy that, you know, the stars are made of helium and, you know, like uh, helium and uh, hydrogen. And unfortunately, her own professor, which was a good professor, Mr. Norris, he rejected the idea 100%. That was so cruel, he did it, but it, she, he plagiarized it after so many years he came up with the Cecilia Payne idea. It was too late anyway. People knew that, you know, that plagiarism is not a good idea. That's what he did. So how could Mr. Cecilia Payne prove her point that, you know, what I proved, I need a spectroscope. So that's why she proved it, and she proved it that the stars are not talking about our sun, we're talking about huge suns, you know, like some of them 10, 20, 100, or million times larger than our suns. This is another idea that, you know, before the spectroscopy, people used to use electrolysis. Even nowadays, it's an amazing idea. Sir Isaac, I mean, uh, Sir Isaac Newton used that, Michael Faraday did that, Sir Humphrey Davy was amazing. He didn't have high education, but he was chemist. And amazingly, Sir Humphrey Davy, the British chemist, he came up with so many ideas. He discovered potassium, sodium in 1807, calcium, barium, magnesium, and boron, and chlorine, which was so important, iodine. And how could he do that? And then what they did, they used electricity, so they reversed the, you know, uh, everything, the process, so they just uh, split, the, you know, everything, like, you know, you can get water and they split it to hydrogen, oxygen, and you can tell which side is a hydrogen, which side is oxygen. That's exactly what he did, Mr. Humphrey did. And uh, unfortunately, at that time, the chemistry was not up to the task, but you know, they discovered so many compounds, which is not element, but they realized it is the element. But of course, what they did was uh, just breakthrough in science. So did Lavoisier. Lavoisier was an amazing uh, person, and uh, he was the only one in science, we're talking about like 200 years ago, there was no electricity, there was no, I mean, uh, special scales, electronic scales like the way we have. I mean, his precision was beyond my imagination. How could he do that with ordinary skill? He discovered the conservation laws of mass. So what he did, well, of course, I don't want to go into detail. He realized the left side is equal to the right side. What he meant that, you know, the equation takes care of the uh, one side is equal to the other side. So Mr. Lavoisier did like uh, discovered carbon, sulfur, iron, copper, and 25 others. But unfortunately he had no idea some of them were compound. They were not, um, I mean, uh, element. So, so did uh, Miss Cecilia Payne, and like I said, and uh, she was the only one she became the Harvard University professor and then the uh, president of the university. I mean, that was great accomplishment at that time. But you know what? I admired what Mr. Uh, Sir Humphrey Davy and Lavoisier did at that time because those days, electricity was almost discovered and then we had like Alessandro Volta in Italy, you know, he became with a battery. Well, of course, uh, that was not his idea, 100% Luigi Galvani helped him. And I would say even though Luigi Galvani was 100% wrong about the animal electricity, but you know, I'm a 
you know, I love the hostess. Fifty percent was the Luigi Galvani and the fifty percent was Lissandro Volta because he initiated everything even though his idea was wrong about the animal electricity, but because Alessandro Volta was physicist, he realized that has nothing to do to the animal electricity that has to do with the different metals. Like, you know, we have like copper and we have zinc and some other things. Well, of course, I will explain it later. And in fact, what I uh, discussed a few minutes ago is electrochemistry. And 18th century, this was so amazing. And uh, I mean, it discovered so many things in science. And uh, you know, even nowadays, you know, I have seen in colleges, universities, they teach this. And imagine we have electrolyte, and then we can have electrolyte like this, and then we can put like a, a zinc and copper, and then we can get voltage, or we can reverse the process, you know, process, and then we can voltage so we can remove the ions from here to here or from negative to positive or positive to negative and imagine how could you tell that the copper we get from the you know nature because nature is amazing everything is compound because of reactivity because of you know oxygen and so many things you cannot find pure gold you cannot find pure I mean aluminum you cannot find so even nowadays this concept is used to separate everything and you know I know sometimes they get copper and then with this we get from atom by atom molecule by molecule it takes long time of course they get 99.99% .99 copper they get lead they get uh, so many other things so they do atom by atom so what happened this system still works which is good you know i admire them what they did so that is the way we can even say how pure one element is some people emailed me and then they asked me one uh, always uh, you mentioned in your theories that you know your uh, inspiration came from animals insects uh, nature science and sometimes sports yes because i do believe most of the time we can take a note how the you know especially animals behave and then we can learn from them one best example is, well, of course, I have so many, just don't want to get your time, uh, like radar. It was in 1925. I was a huge, I mean, excitement for people that came up with the radar before the world wars, and then they could just detect the airplanes coming to, you know, German airplanes coming to invade, so they could sh shut them down, and then so many other things. So sometimes, you know, the, the they had to go fly low uh, in, inside the valley so they could, uh, you know, be undetected and so on so. But overall, that was amazing idea what they did those days. But now everything is so different. So like a bat is amazing animal. I have never seen two bats because when I was a kid, I, uh, you know, when I was so young, I studied natural science. So I was graduated with highest honor in, you know, county of Tehran, which is five times bigger than Los Angeles. And the uh, natural science was so good because we had uh, chemistry was so bad, so difficult. We had like physics was so difficult. We had like plants, animals, and the killer one was, uh, you know, like evolution, which was so difficult. Those names are so difficult. I was like 15 years old. It was not easy for me to, but you know, I graduated with high clothes. So I love animals. I love insects. So now I will post some of them so you can see what I mean by animals and uh, why my inspiration came from animals and insects. I mean, there is no way that we are the match for the animals. Like this one, let me post this for you. You can see it. This is for the bat. This is amazing animal. And imagine, bat is like a radar. 
But the only thing is, he is catching the prey. I mean, small insects like you know moth and some other things. And you know, I heard that sometime in the caves they eat like four thousand, five thousand a day, because they are so good. They have an appetite, and God knows. But you know what? This part is so I mean unknown for the history. Why the moth is emitting frequency, confusing this bat. And the bat has no idea if the sound is coming from here, there, and that part, you know, scientists cannot figure it out. So my idea was always like this. Why the humans did not pay attention to the animals so they could discover more things before we take care of, you know, before 1935. Like radar helped a lot. Nowadays, it doesn't even play any role because, you know, like Air Force One can fly and then you can't even detect because, you know, they can go, uh, they can do something and then the light is not, light will, or I mean, the electromagnetic wave will be bounced off so you have no idea what they are. But those days, like a uh, hundred years ago, this radar was so good and then I have never seen these bats. They sometimes go in a group, thousand together, and they never collide. I have seen sometimes <coughs> birds and they just take off. Maybe thousand, ten thousand of them, they never collide. I have never even seen one bird falls on the ground. But you know, there was an experiment I saw they were doing in Texas, and then there was these young people doing some uh, drones, but that was computerized. They worked on it months and months and months, and those, you know, drones were far apart. But I'm talking about birds, they are so close. So this is the way the nature does. When I did this a year ago, there was a lot of compliments by uh, people, and they loved this idea because they emailed me. <coughs> they said, Juan, do you have any background in... Uh... See what happened here. Okay, they have one. Do you have any background in airplane or things like that? I said, no, all I know is in natural science. I used to live in Colorado, let me get my... Yeah, I used to live in Colorado, and then I used to sit in my balcony and drink beer, and then at the same time I was having, uh, you know, just fun and then watching the geese. Colorado has amazing life. I mean, uh, it's so mountainous and then the life is so good. And one day I realized something amazing. I realized geese is exactly flying like a delta. This is called delta or V-shape they call it. Because when I was a kid, I had a friend, his dad was a pilot. They used to take, I was maybe six, seven years old, we would go. And then I was so curious. I said, Juan, how could you have so many questions? Is beyond your head. I said, yeah. I was asking about the squadron. The 16 airplanes are called the squadron. Think about that. John is here, is the pilot for the third airplane, and they wanted to get out somehow there's a problem and they want to land immediately. But let me show you with the airplane so you would understand exactly what I mean by this. I have to take this off. You can see. See? And then I was having beer and then all of a sudden I stop and then I realized always they have a litter. Even nowadays they don't know. People have no idea what they have. Litter. And, and, and then the head over here. See this case is going to go this way then they were making a lot of noise. I realized exactly the way they do it on here. If John or whoever is the pilot on third one or the fourth one wants to go out, they cannot just fly like that. So when they do, they roll first. See, I bring this up. You can see they roll first and they yaw and then they pitch like this. In other words, they are avoiding being hit by these two because they adjust exactly the same speed. I said, well, wait a minute, who learned? Did we learn from the animals or they learned from us? And then I realized we learned from animals. As you see on airplane, you have like lift, we have drag, and then we have gravity and we have thrust. And then always is exactly like this. So we have roll here and we have yaw, which is this way. And then we have pitch. And if they don't do that, they won't be able to do anything.
And then I realized why this kiss is always flying so good like this. And then I realized they are doing laws of thermodynamics, I mean, laws of aerodynamics. See, this is called, uh, you know, when the cyclists are less, you know what? They go behind each other so they get less drag, I mean, less, you know, resistance. So this is exactly what they are doing. But it's so much science. Well, there were, of course, so many. I just uh, decided to show you some so people will know exactly why my inspiration came from. This is another one, and I really, you know, I, I saw in University of Boulder, they love it, and there was a university professor. He came over, he got my phone number, and then we exchanged views and so on. So, I'm always interested in insects, I mean, animals, and so on. So, one day I was watching, it was rainy so bad, and then I realized the reason why the worms come out because they don't want to be drowned. And then I realized earthworm is exactly like a sound waves. And then I checked, I took pictures, I realized, yes, it's earthworm. You see here, we have like condensation, we have rarefaction, this is exactly. So the worm, what it does is, a, you know, condensation here, then here is stretching, you know, the body. That's the way the locomotion for the, you know, uh, earthworm is. And then one day, I was watching the, the smallest snakes, I realized this is electromagnetic wave. See, it doesn't matter the snake in water or things like that. This is like a row, you know, it's pushing against the water, pushing against the water. So these are exactly like the electromagnetic waves. And you can see here, electromagnetic waves is exactly like this. And then I remember one time I watched the eel, which is amazing, uh, you know, I mean, this creature is so unique, and then in South America you can find. And then I uh, went online and realized some eels can do generate up to 600 volt DC, which is killer. And then I realized this is exactly what the cops are using, like a taser beam to, uh, I mean, to incapacitate people, not to kill them, at least temporarily incapacitate them, and then they can take care of them. Well, of course, I have 10 more, but I'm not going to show you all. This is another one. This is about the radar with airplane and like a bat, which I explained already. And dolphin is amazing. Uh, I mean, extremely smart. But you know, people like us, we studied even in high school that the speed of sound is 340 meters per second, but in water is almost like five times, 1,490. But the dolphin knows about this. It's all echoing, you know. Dolphin knows exactly there's a little fish here. There's something here, so they go catch it. It's all by sonar. So, see, this all science. And you know, we, we discovered about the, all of his many years after this. This is another one, and I bet you have seen uh, maple trees. Let me post this so you can see. I bet you, can, you have seen maple trees, and then uh, Colorado has so many of them, especially in, you know, uh, fault, you can see this is a maple tree, so I had to get this, analyze it, I had to weigh this with a fantastic electronic, I mean, uh, scale, which was showing microns. It was so, so, I mean, delicate. And then I realized this is less than one-sixth of a gram. You see, this part is more, is heavier, and this part is a little bit less, and it's exactly like a dragonfly. There's, you know, fine lines over here. You can even see through it because it's so fine. So what happened, this is resisting, you know, acceleration. I call them helicopter. When they are falling, they are not falling under the tree. They fall away from the tree. See, the nature provided something. These are all laws of aerodynamics, and in fact, 
these are always connected together. This is helping the other, the other is helping this one. So they just rotate and no matter what, because this is a heavy side and this is the, you know, not heavy, but you know, it's like has a pitch. And then I measured this almost like less than two degrees pitch. But sometimes, you know, they are not 100% right because, you know, they get dried out and not exactly. But see, this shows exactly where the pitches are. And then they throw. And then I realized this is not the only one. We have like parachute. And then it doesn't matter how you uh, catch this. It's always going down because here is more. This is like a parachute and this seat is heavier and it's going down a straight. So the main idea for this uh, summer house is, you know, to fall away from the tree so they can have more. Well, I'd like to thank for watching and then I'm hoping uh, next one is going to be electromagnetic wave and then the uh, Doppler effect and even laser. So hoping that, you know, next time I'm not going to be one month, hopefully every two weeks I'm going to publish one because people ask, why do you take such a long time to publish? So from now on I decided to do every two weeks and I'm hoping you guys will learn. And uh, I received a lot of emails. It was so encouraging for me. And uh, that is called feedback. If you guys, uh, emailed me and then I realized if I made a mistake I will you know make sure that you know I have to take care of everything next time you know I have to be more specific I have to explain everything the way I'm supposed to explain and uh, thanks a lot for watching and if you like the video you can subscribe it and like I said in two more weeks I'm, I'm going to publish another one and then another one and uh, one exciting one which you know it was my expertise it was the color perception this is going to be so exciting for you guys because I did unique experiment I have never seen in any books anywhere because these are so unique for the color perception. I analyze either light, but overall everything is, you know, for the light or electromagnetic wave, which is the center of my attention for the next theories to come. Thanks a lot for watching and hopefully you can subscribe if you want. Thank you. Bye-bye.